Welcome to the Digital Thread. Today I'm here with Peter Casanza from ROI Group. Welcome, Peter. Hey, it's good to be here. So I wanted to bring you on today because you are, to me, a specialist in the facility management world and you really understand the trends that are going on better than most people. Uh, can you tell me what kind of trends you're seeing right now in the facility management world? It's um, ironically, uh, a very exciting time. What's very interesting is as the concept of a smart building is coming along, facilities are becoming more and more important. And as Autodesk, you know that there's all sorts of data that's gathered during the design and construction phase, which could help people in facilities. There's all sorts of movements on the other end. So if you look at the top class of facility management systems, the acronym's called IWMS or CPIP, all of the major players have been bought by a major computing power or a major corporation. Well, can you go into a little bit more depth on the IoT and the sensors for me? I know you've brought a few, and I think what's going on right now is I've talked to folks, and they don't really know what sensor brands are out there. They don't know what a sensor looks like, and they don't really know what sensors do. Let's dive into that. So the, the good thing about sensors is they're all over the place. A ring doorbell is a sensor. It's not kind of thought of that way, but it's a, it's a IoT device that does connect to a network. And one of the things that's driving facilities uh, and a problem with facilities is generally you don't know what's going on until something broke. From a perspective, if we could put a check engine light on different pieces of equipment to let us know when something was going awry before it went awry, it would help us be a lot more efficient. Uh, cutting edge right now, and I'll do this for comparison, this is the smallest commercial sensor on the market. And to give you an idea how small it is, this is a Scrabble tile. It's the exact size. You look here, it's half the format. They're discreet. They really are. And as you talk about sensors, one of the things that I like talking about this, um, this has a 10 to 15 year battery life. Um, and if you look at the size and form factor, there's not a lot of material. One of the things that has to happen for sensors to take mass adoption is the construction cost needs to come down and the battery life needs to come up. And the reason why I kind of point this out is it shows that. Also, as you start looking at sensors, there's all sorts of ideas. So if I had a big screen behind me, this is a temperature sensor. It tells me uh, what the temperature is in the current room. There are all sorts of different things you can do, though, when you start creating algorithms. So one of the things that can be done with this sensor, if you take it and you put it in a little holder here, do some conductive tape. And in Europe, tracking Legionella and pipes is a big deal. Uh, I don't have a bar uh, twisty tie, so I'm not going to connect this, but the temperature sensor will pick up the water moving in the pipe and based on algorithms, it'll let you know when it needs to be flushed. Pretty cool concept and the people who made the temperature sensor had no idea. As I talk about more use cases as I do this, and you start to think about these are going to be everywhere and this is just one sensor, same sensors being used by occupancy. So if I stuck one of these right here underneath your desk, uh, the air temperature would rise and the sensor would know what's going on. So um, we use some of these sensors on our pilot with the Charles Wright Museum. The Charles Wright Museum is an African history museum in Detroit. Um, what they're doing is really interesting with your help. Uh, they're tracking how occupants are going through their actual um, exhibits. So they have sensors on the doors for when the doors are yeah. open from you. And then they're also tracking CO2 in the room as a discreet way to track how people are lingering in the room. So it's been really interesting to see these in motion um, because occupants would never even notice them due to their size. They're not invasive and they're just very discreet. And, and if you think about it, several years ago, this isn't something we'd even consider. Um, so as I talk about, you know, use case A down here that I showed you all, the amount of technology that's going into this space is incredible. So earlier you said smart building. Can you tell our audience about the connection between smart building and digital twins? So the concept of a smart building or digital twin, um, largely when you go out and talk to people in the industry, it's defined by someone that sells a piece of software. No offense to Autodesk, I, I love the software that they have. Um, or someone that's listened to a salesperson. Uh, a digital twin basically has two elements. It has uh, an electronic representation of the real world. 
and uh, in the Autodesk world, products that would give us that are Revit and Autodesk Tandem. The second co concept within a digital twin is what's happening within that space. Most of that data is going to be driven by sensors, but it can be driven by other things as well. So for example, where the lights are turned on, you could model that as a digital twin and look, look at the sun. As you look at this though, those two concepts pull together and create what I call a smart building. And I laugh because I could take a, one sensor, like a ring doorbell, and put it in front of a small building and make it a smart building because it would have a sensor. Um, but it kind of depends on the different level that you're looking at. The nice thing about all of this, even though there's going to be more tracking going on, we know that buildings are incredibly inefficient. And what sensors and smart buildings are going to be able to do is to enable us to run them more efficiently and as a result, save energy and save the planet and make people feel better. It's kind of like, you know, the triple win. An immediate need that I see in the industry is that uh, when someone's built a new building and they hand it over, 95% of all data is a loss in the construction handover. Can you speak to how the digital twin is helping facility managers? I can. And, and this is where I felt like a voice crying out in the darkness for the last 20 years. The tools that are coming along, um, particularly a good example is Autodesk Tandem, where you can start with a conceptual model update information about what's in that facility. So for example, you know, you might specify you need a piece of HVAC equipment that meets a certain load. Well, the building's going to be built a couple of years later. So you might have put in a train one, two, three, four, and you might end up with a Schneider four, five, six, could you value engineered or whatever? Well, Tandem allows you to update that information. And my hope is I'm working with different clients in Tandem and we're still kind of at the early adopters, but I'm seeing it start to work is if the owners can work a little closer with the construction firms using Tandem as kind of a bridge, they can say, hey, this is the information that I need to track a piece of equipment. Uh, and I'd like to tell you all out there in the AEC world, it's rocket science, but the facility manager usually cares about something called the unique identifier, make, model, type, all the other information that might be uh, accompanied with that can be done in a table joint somewhere in a database, either inside Tandem, or you could do it inside your maintenance management system or your asset management system. Well, thank you, Peter, for coming on today. It was great having ROI Consulting Group educate us on IoT sensors and what trends are going on in the facility management world. I really appreciate your time. And thank you very much. Of course, thank you.